On this week's Selected Shorts, we dedicated the entire hour to the great Margaret Atwood. The episode features part of a conversation between Atwood and novelist A.M. Holmes, recorded at our live show at Symphony Space. As promised, here is the extended interview. They talk about everything from feminism, time, writing, and dystopian fiction to Atwood's new short story collection, Old Babes in the Wood. The collection has it all. It explores terrifying futuristic visions, whimsical fantasies, and realistic depictions of marriage. In the heartbreaking story Widows, performed in the program by Ellen Burstyn, Atwood revisits characters Nell and Tig, a couple featured in several Atwood collections, in the form of a letter after Tig has died. Now here's Margaret Atwood and A.M. Holmes. There is about this book a melancholia that feels deep and serious and not different because it's it's through everything but hearing you go back to these characters this couple is is both beautiful and kind of heartbreaking one of my questions that i had it sort of phrased in a different way is i want to ask you about time and has time changed for you both as you've gotten older in the sense that that people can live in multiple times simultaneously no older you dear Old, actually. I know. I'm faking it pretty well, but I'm pretty old. No, you're not. <laughs> I'm the same age as the year I was born. I'm 61. That's for me. I thought I was never going to get past 15, so, you know. Yes, I didn't think I was going to get past 30. We all have these, I know, uh, exactly. we all have these things. But, you know, um, if Keith Richard can do it, we can do it, right? Mm-hmm. Anyway, yes. Yeah, yeah. so, so you're a mere child. I'm just telling <laughs> you that. <laughs> of course time changes but it changes for everyone. So this is just something as human beings. Should we be so lucky, we all move through. Do you feel though in in terms of both in your sort of lived experience and in your fiction, that the way that you experience and use time, like I think more and more about time existing and people and experiences, sort of on multiple platforms simultaneously, that we can be here and in the past and the future all in the same moment. That happens. So uh, one way of explaining it, I suppose, is to say that older people remember what it was like to be young, but young people, although they dread and fear, don't know what it's like to be older, although some writers have taken a stab at it. I'm thinking of Muriel Spark writing Mm -hmm. Memento Mori. She was quite young when she wrote that. I'm thinking of Tennyson writing Ulysses and Tithonus as two uh, companion pieces about being very old. He was a young poet at the time. I thought he did a pretty good job, especially with Tithonus. But, you know, this is is the thing. And, And your perspective changes. So when I was a quite a lot younger, such as 18 or 19. I wrote a a story about a woman who was very, 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 very old and all dried up and sort of wrinkly and withered and past it and no hope. 27, right? No, she was 40. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Good guess, though. Yeah. So somebody else describes, somebody in her 20s describes sitting on on a bus and hearing some teenagers talking about that lady. Yeah, <laughs> the way you talk about that lady, and then she realized, I am that lady. <laughs> That's what I, I am I, now. Yes. That lady. Yes, I always thought when I first got to New York City a long time ago, I thought I'm never going to be that lady in the Greenwich Village post office wearing black jeans and whatever. And I'm like, oh my god, I have been that lady so often lately. Well, I'm beyond that lady. I know. <laughs> I'm, I'm at the point where I can I can get my bag put in the overhead bin on the plane, and I, and I don't even have to act indignant about it. In fact, I I bring it on by climbing up on the seat and trying to put it up myself. <laughs> <laughs> well, they're gonna they're gonna stop that you right there. Right, exactly. flurry. Right. That causes yeah, exactly. a flurry. I can tell you. Oh, yeah. get down off there. <laughs> yeah. That's really funny because usually they say, oh no, we not, we're not allowed to help you. But I guess if you're climbing on the furniture, they'll That'll probably go it. for it. Right, exactly. <laughs> Well, if not the attendants, some other passenger will run. Yeah, they I freak out. I not be giving away these trade secrets. <laughs> <laughs> There's so many paths I want to go down with that. But I also want to say t- today is International Women's Day, which yeah. I, I, <laughs> yeah. well, I would is, like to say that Margaret it started it. It is a bit it, like Mother's Day, you have right. to admit. Like, why only? Never mind. So I don't... 
Yes. So I don't know. Be if he's... grateful for the one day. Right. Yeah. Right. Exactly. <laughs> and there are protests today all over the all over the world. And and in London they marched from Westminster to the embassy. And and hundreds of women were wearing the Handmaid's costume and carrying photographs of women who'd either been killed or arrested in Iran. Exactly. Yeah. So I guess I'm curious where that landed with you. And and how does it feel to to have created and to carry that and to see it continue on and accrue other meaning. Okay, so I didn't invent women feeling <laughs> outraged. I did not invent you know, that. Um, it started with time. Right? Well, it started with reality. Right. Okay. Um, but the, the fact that we live in an age of television means mm-hmm. that this is a very instant visual symbol. So it was actually some women in Texas who kicked it off. Uh, they they wanted to wear Handmaid's Tales outfit into the Texas legislature, which was filled with guys in dark suits right. who, who looked like a shot out of the Handmaid's Tale series, I have to say. And they sent away for something they thought was going to be these red outfits. And when they arrived, they were pink. Oh. So this was not <laughs> this was not going to do. So right. they they very quickly sewed them. And they are perfect in a way because you can put them on, you can go in, you cannot be expelled for being disruptive because you're not saying anything, and you cannot be expelled for being immodestly dressed because you are all covered up. Right. But anybody looking at you knows what that means. So it did spread all around the world, and I can see that it is still... Uh, being is because it is so immediate and visual. If it were, if we were just in the age of radio, this would not be happening. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. But we are beyond the age of radio, and and I I saw this this morning when I was looking. I saw the march. Uh, I saw them. They got to the thing and threw off the outfits. Right. And as their gesture of I'm not doing this anymore. So yeah, how does it feel to me? Well. Smart them, and they're welcome to do it. Right. Be my guest. If it works, if it works, then that's what you do. I have so many questions, but I thought I'll go by what's happening in the room. One of them was also about feminism. So I was thinking about how so often it seemed to me that the idea was presented, not by women necessarily, that if you were a feminist, you had to hate men. And all of my favorite feminists, you, Grace Paley, are to me incredible examples of women who love men deeply and are still feminists. And I, I guess my question is, how do we teach people that, they, that feminism doesn't mean hate men, it just means like get paid equally and be treated fairly? Okay, there are 75 different schools of feminism. I know. Which yeah. you know. And therefore one picks a sect. And the sect that I align myself with, and we, we did the launch of the testaments with them is, is equality now. Right. And they work on laws uh, having to do with girls and women to make the laws themselves more equal. So we all know that just because you have a law doesn't mean that it's respected, uh, it can be window dressing and all the rest of it, but at least it is an indication that, that this is how things ought to be. So I, right. I'd rather work on the legal structure mm-hmm. of things rather right. than be back in 19, do I remember, 72, when it was deeply symbolic, whether you wore overalls and work boots. Right. Hopefully at some point we'll get to do a longer conversation with more, whatever, more Absolutely. questions. Should, My, I, should I live that long? You will. You think? You absolutely, you must. <laughs> you must, because I would be, I would feel very alone, actually. Um, oh, dear. I feel like I've turned into like a one of those comedy shows that gets really serious at the end. No, I would. I would feel terribly alone. I think, you know, as a, as a side note, this is, your work has made possible my work and, and the work of many, many people. When it were not for the adventures and, yeah, I mean, really. There's no way that we would have been able to do what we do. It's very sweet. I, I thought the Silence of the Lambs made possible your work. <laughs> No, Margaret. You know, the funny thing is, I don't like scary things. I can't watch scary things. I can't read scary things. But you I'm write like, scary things. People do scary things, people but I, do scary I know. Things. Yes, but it's I true. don't, I don't, yeah. You don't roll around in it. I try not to because it's, <laughs> it's upsetting. So, 
Growing up, my parents were always like, we're going to move to Canada. If Nixon gets elected again, we're out of here. And I was like, Canada. So to me, Canada is you, Joni Mitchell, and Leonard Cohen. With a <laughs> and there's, there's a fire pit and, I don't know, maybe moose, but more like marshmallows in my imagination. Well, you've got marshmallows here, for heaven's sake. I know, but I, I think it's the three... to Canada three, for the marshmallows. The three of you are up there doing that. But then I think about it, and I feel like your horizon line is very, very large. And it is, you know, having made the notes for Handmaid's Tale at Radcliffe, writing it in Berlin. And I guess I'm curious about both that large horizon line, and maybe it comes from Canada being so big, but also, is there a Canadian sensibility? Is there something... Let me explain it Thanks. to you, dear. <laughs> I might just sit on the floor at your feet, but then I wouldn't be able to get up. <laughs> Canada's very large in area, and we have an unofficial national song called Canada's Really Big. <laughs> <laughs> it's by a group with a very Canadian name, which is the Arrogant Worms. Oh, exactly. Yeah. So it's got the humility, the mm -hmm, fake humility totally. in there, plus the arrogance of thinking you're really big. So yes, Canada's really big, but it has a lot fewer people in it than the United States has. It's always been uh, multilingual from right. the get-go, not just French and English, but 52 spoken indigenous languages. Right. And many other languages uh, of people that have come to Canada and still speak those languages. So it's like that, and when I wrote The Handmaid's Tale, there were three different national reactions to it. England, which said, jolly good yarn, Margaret, ho ho, because... <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> because they'd had their religious civil war in the 17th century, and sure. whatever other stupid thing they were gonna do, it wasn't that. We have just seen the stupid thing they did. Right. But it wasn't that. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Canada, which nervously asks when it, whatever horrible thing is going on, they nervously ask, can it happen here? Right. Or more conditionally, could it happen here? Mm -hmm. And the United States, which split down the middle in 1985 with one half saying, don't be silly, Margaret, you silly person. Uh, we are a liberal democracy. We are the land of the true, the beautiful, the good, the free, and the, and the luminous, and we will never do any such bad thing. And the other half said, how long have we got? Yeah. <laughs> so like that. And I think the reason the United States is like that is that you've only got two political parties. Right. So it tends to be more like this. Right. We've got six. Because we have things to do, people. Well, um, I don't know. Yeah. I mean, I think it's very yeah. hard to start another political party here because it's so entrenched. Anyway, I'm not yeah. counting you out by any means. <laughs> by any means, I'm not counting you out. And that's could I, why could I Could you adopt it. me? Could I just come up there? <laughs> <laughs> I'm willing well, to leave. Okay, just you know. a minute now. Yeah. Yeah. Canada is not the land of the pure and the wonderful. I thought it was until it, recently. It, it isn't. Yeah. Everything's relative. Right. Yes, we've got our own bad behaviors and we've got our own bad history things that people did and all the rest of it. They're somewhat different from yours, but we've got them. And every country does. You know, so nobody's... Nobody's perfect. Yeah, so is it, it's, <laughs> it's, that's the end of some like it hot. <laughs> <laughs> I've got news for you. I'm a man. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. So is there a Canadian sensibility? Is there a... Oh, yeah. And how would you describe it? I would describe it at great length. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I'll make it simple. South of you, you've got Mexico. Mm -hmm. South of us, we've got you. Right. Okay. North of you, you've got us. Right. And north of us, we've got Russia. So okay. it's a different geopolitical situation. Right. Indigenous people in Canada have a lot more land and a lot more power than they do here. There are historical reasons for that. So a while ago there was a, a contest in a magazine in Canada that said, complete the sentence as Canadian as, mm -hmm. as in as American as apple pie. Right. 
and the winner was as Canadian as possible under the circumstances. <laughs> That's or pretty good. E.L. Doctorow, yeah. who is a pal, said, right. uh, the Canadians didn't like my book. I said, the Canadians loved your book. He said, how can you tell? <laughs> They do go in for understatement. So right. you just you need the simultaneous translation machine. So American version, this is the greatest thing ever. It's better than sliced bread. It's practically next to God and just the most fantastic thing. And and the Canadian equivalent is not bad at all. Right, right. <laughs> Certainly my students are all writing dystopian worlds and so on. And I can't decide now in a panic, are they writing to run away from something, or are they writing us towards something? Well, they're writing that kind of fiction because they're afraid to write social realism. Uh, but if you put them on another planet and they're, and they're green, blue, and purple, they're going to feel safer about that. That's one of my theories. Right. My, my other theory is that people are scared of our present-day position that we find ourselves in. So dystopias are a kind of what if scenario, right. like what if things get really quite a lot worse than they are now, how will we make our way through that? You'll notice that none of them just uh, has everybody die on page 98. Right. There's, there's, there's always somebody left, right. because that's what stories are. There's, there's always somebody left, even though there might not be, as it were. I don't mean to frighten you. <laughs> <laughs> You've talked a tiny bit about writing work that frightens you. And I've certainly written work that was frightening to me and clearly scared a lot of other people too. How do you navigate writing something that you find scary? Well, if it convinces me, I think I probably better keep going. It's, it's when you fail to be convinced by your own inventions that you know that this probably should go in the drawer right. or possibly the waste paper basket. Um, but, if, but if you find yourself sucked into it, that's probably a good sign as far as it's being a convincing story. You, you have to first convince yourself. If you're not convinced by it, nobody else is going to be either. I think that's totally true. I always say if you don't believe that you can write it, you can't, because you have to believe all of it. Thank you so, so much, not just for this, but for everything and all of it. And thank you. Thank you very, very much. Thank you. Thank you.